Welcome to the Omnibus Show, a program for people who are interested in everything, with deep conversations on a wide variety of subjects. And now your host, Dave Gibbs. Well, hello and welcome to this episode of the Omnibus Show, the program for people who are interested in everything, with deep conversations on a wide variety of subjects. Today's guest is Anne Croker. Anne is a writing coach, and her clients include published authors and aspiring writers. She's a writer herself with a number of titles to her list, which include uh, The Art of Writing to Motherhood. In addition, her podcast, Anne Croker Writing Coach, goes over topics from AI to grammar and style, from poetry to publishing. In addition, on her website, she has a blog, which corresponds with her, her podcast. And also, Anne is a professional speaker. Welcome, Anne. Thank you. It's great to have you here. Yes. Thanks for inviting me. Well, there's so much I'd like to talk to you about today, but um, starting off, you've done so much. You have writing in your heritage, and um, you've done a lot. Could you please just tell us about your milestones? Mm. Well, it is helpful, I think, to look back on where writers have been. What, what are their inflection points? But it does go back to the, to the very beginning, because my parents were both journalists. And so I grew up around the smell of, of ink and newsprint. And both of them worked for the Indianapolis Star. And they collected books. And so every room in the house, and I mean every room, was really um, walled with books. And so I had this literary background and a, a love of words surrounding me. But of everybody in the family, we've had two journalists and my brother went on to become a successful advertising executive. I was the least likely to have anything to do with writing. And yet it was my deep desire. So I was battling against this idea that nobody really viewed me as a writer, but I wanted it. So it really... It sounds like a writer. <laughs> I think it's a lot of people's backstory. And so what did it take? There were little secret things I would do. I found a book about discovering yourself that had to do with writing. And that really opened me up privately. But it wasn't until college that I signed up for a creative writing class at the university I went to. And there... I suddenly had a chance to really learn and practice fiction and poetry. And I really thought I would blossom as a, as a short story writer. But where it really all came to uh, fruition was through poetry. And because it wasn't journalism and it wasn't advertising, because it was poetry, I kind of had my own little starting point to become a writer. So that's where I would say it really all began in terms of me being able to be seen and viewed by my family and by the public as a writer, it started with poetry. Mm -hmm. But then from there, I, I really started to explore almost every kind of writing that was available. I developed, um, I started as a freelance writer and did all kinds of freelance writing from working with corporations and companies to submitting to magazines and working at the Indianapolis Star myself as a freelance feature writer. But then from there, I started blogging be before we even knew what it was. I had to explain what blogging was. I was early to it. I'm writing articles, I'm writing blog posts, and I started to connect with some communities of writers. And that's where, through those relationships, and I encourage every writer to look for fellow writers to connect with, that's where my career took off in a new way. And I began editing. And I began editing writers who, some of them became much more prominent in time. And that was amazing. And each time I was trying something new, I had a mentor. Mm -hmm. And that too is something I encourage people to consider a mentor, teachers, coaches, it really makes a difference and can speed up yeah. the writing experience. That's very critical. I then think. people were saying you should write a book about these topics related to motherhood, which is what my life was looking like at the time. So I did. I wrote one book, another book. And then eventually in my edit editorial phase where I was editing people's work, that's when I, I um, wrote the book on being a writer. That's when I was beginning to do the coaching and these days, while I still write, most of what I do is coach other writers, and I love it. 
That's fabulous. You've, you've, um, I've listened to your podcasts and you really cover a lot of subjects. Um, one of the more recent, um, episodes I found very interesting was, um, and I hear a lot of people talking about it now. Elon Musk has spoken recently about the AI and, um, you were talking about, is it chat GBT? And, um, the concern was about the loss of the creative process in the future where everything gets automated through this, this program. And, um, I do agree with the outcome that you mentioned, but, um, you know, could you tell us a little bit about that? Cause that's a big thing about writing. And what do you think about, um, writing that, you know what I mean? The writing process in the writing industry as it is, um, living in parallel to AI. Whatever I say today will probably be obsolete. By next week. By, by tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> it's changing that fast. Yes. There is no turning back. The genie is out of the bottle yeah. or we've opened Pandora's box, whichever way you want to view it. Um, and, and so it's, it's here and we have to figure out what we're going to do with it. Yes. Now, you're, we're going to see a lot of interesting things happen. I think we're going to see a lot of um, new things happening with publishing where they're tapping into it in various ways. I'm not informed enough to address that specifically. Sure. But I will say what an individual writer could do, and I've heard other people say this is not my unique idea, but I think we could start viewing it as our research assistant. So if you were going to hire an intern or a research assistant to help you with various aspects of your writing life, to speed things up, that's a good use of AI at this point. Yes. And as, as just use it to ask it questions the same as you would do if you were training an intern to help you find what you needed for your next project. That's just one simple thing you could do to play with it in a way where you're not having it actually write what you do, but you're having it research and help you develop what you want to write. And it can speed up the process. Aside from that, I think we, we have to start being realistic that it's here. So playing with it, like play with it without fear and see what's, see what it can do because it's, it's going to be a part of our creative lives. I'm sorry. I'm thinking comically while you're saying that I'm thinking of being like in the space odyssey <laughs> and it's like, you know, open up the, uh, the writing program, Hal. I'm mm -hmm. sorry. I can't do that, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I, you know, one thing I think uh, that, any kind of program or automation can't replace as people and the soul of a person, I think has a depth that no program can, can reach. It, it might be able to collate um, style and in a clever way, but I don't think that the, the insight of the person will ever be touched. Well, it's trained on the ideas we've already put out there. Right. And, and that's because writers had to do the initial thinking. Writers had to do the initial synthesizing of ideas yeah. and expressing those ideas. Absolutely. I think the humanity piece is, you know, it's what's in here and here. It, right. it, it can't do that. It, it can parrot that. it. Right. And it can pull together ideas and, and mimic what we've written because that's what it's doing. It's pulling from existing material. Sure. But moving forward to become distinct to stand out if mm -hmm. we you don't let don't let chat gpt write for you because you're going to sound like everybody else right maybe let it help you outline a piece and then decide how much of that you want to use that might be an interesting way to quickly de determine what you want to say in a given book or article or essay just to kind of get some ideas rolling but yeah you bring your own stories you bring your own ideas opinions values all of that it doesn't have those no that's very true so um, going back to you, because I know that, you know, writing is um, like when I had photography, but having also written myself, the, um, you read a lot and you, you really, good writing, I'll let others judge me, but the thing is to be a good writer, to be a good artist, photographer, everything, you really need to study those who've gone before. A lot of people will compliment me on old words or words that I'll throw out there. And, and my line to them is I read old books. And so, um, which is pretty true. And um, so I compliment the old writers for that. Um, 
who have been some of the writers that have have influenced you? And, and that can be, since you're writing coach, would be people who are more, can be a technical person or, you know, or it could be a writer like a John Gardner type, you know. Mm. Well, that's a really interesting question. I read, I don't read quickly. Let me restate this. Okay. Who's one person that... Um, either now or previously, has really opened up your imagination on writing? Mm, I'm going to tweak your question. And That's say fine. It's helped me gain confidence as a writer and inspired me as a writer. would be a mashup of two Anns, Annie Dillard and Anne Lamott. Okay. Two very different writers. Very One more literary, thoughtful, reflective. And Anne Lamott is a little bit Emotive. snarky, yeah, and, snarky. And, and conversational. Yeah. And... Each one offered something new to me. One is, wow, you can write rich, beautiful, lyrical, thoughtful kinds of pieces. And with Anne, you can be yourself. Right. You can you can sound like yourself on the page. Mm -hmm. And you can say what you really think. And she does craft it. It's not just her spilling it out. Sure. She does craft That's, it. That's, I think, the big difference. And I, I, I think, her prose. Yeah. And so each one of those women has contributed to my own writing. And... Um, I'll get more into this in the second chapter, but also in writing. What was the difference between writing poetry and writing prose? Well, obviously, it's condensed, tight. You can use fragments that work as a single line or a single phrase in a poem. And so it's, a, it's just a completely different way of approaching things. You generally aren't looking to become a professional poet. There are professional poets, but it's not generally thought of as a career. Um, so for me, it became that way in. It becomes a way for me to process things when I'm not ready to really express it in an expository way or storytelling narrative way. Sometimes I, the way in for me, especially hard things I need to come at slant, to borrow from Emily Dickinson, is through poetry. But I do feel like my background as a poet definitely improved my prose mm -hmm. because now every word matters. So over here, I mean, maybe not every word, but it really helped me begin to craft my prose. And so I think they've gone together for me yes. and made me a stronger writer of prose. That's good. That's really good. Um, going back to your podcast and blogs, you really do cover a lot of subjects rather than a singularity thing. Um, regarding writing or just talking about grammar and our, our, our latest sponsor is Grammarly or can I say that? Um, you know, um, you know, there's so many things you can, you can go over. What is, um, what is one subject that has really stood out that has from, from your clients and from your listeners has really touched them in terms of how to improve writing? I mean, there are disciplines required if you really want to improve your craft. Mm -hmm. You mentioned one already. We have to read. We have to read, and we need to read, I think, critically, too, for understanding the meaning of the writing that we're reading. But also, as writers, we can go in and mark it up and see how did they transition from this idea to the next. And I think when people started realizing that they could do that. And there are some episodes about that, just picking apart other people's writing and then understanding that with an understanding of grammar. I mean, go take a grammar class and refresh yourself if it's been a few years since you've been in college composition classes. And so when we, when we combine the reading, analyzing it, analyzing the writing itself and how they did it, and then we practice writing, I mean, you have to write, yes. and then getting input on that writing. Because otherwise, we could be making the same mistakes over and over. Oh, sure. So you combine those three things. That's where I can talk about a lot of aspects of this. And it becomes, the, the answer is doing the work, as Stephen Pressfield says in uh, the, uh, the, what is it, The War of Art. He talks about doing the work. That's the answer to all, all kinds of ways that we've been stuck. Yes. Do the work. But the do, what does do the work mean? It means this. It means read, analyze it. Have conversations with other people about it if you can. Write and get input on your writing and apply what you're learning each time to iterate and be, become better. And so I think all of, I touch on all these things episode by episode, but I do it in really short bursts. Yes. So people get just one little nugget along the way. So maybe it's that episode that's about um, overcoming writer's block by doing the work. Or maybe it's about 
thinking about something as practical as citations, which will, by the way, save every author a lot of headache down the road if they cite their sources as they're writing. Mm -hmm. Some people put it off till the end. And right. then they have to put their end notes together for their books, for their nonfiction books. And it can and, be a nightmare if they don't do it. It's These a nightmare. And then those are the things that people pass over. Yeah. I don't so, want to go through that because I don't have to read through that. Yeah, and so when they gather these practical things, suddenly they feel really empowered mm -hmm. that they can do the work now. I feel like I know better what it looks like or, or feels like to be a writer. Yeah. I, you know, I hear you. I, I think that the for writers, and, uh, and as well as in other fields, one thing that you've mentioned is it's confidence. And confidence comes from knowledge. And the knowledge, well, more understanding knowledge than just stuff in your know you know bits of information in your head it's got to be there has to be some coming together with that and um yeah you, you it's one of those things you have to go out on an adventure and find out for yourself and um it's interesting because there's a two-way side to that because when you read when i read when i say an author i'm reading them a lot of the time and it's not just this, you know, taken apart, you know. I think one person who stands out is, is Hemingway, who, whether it's fictionalized or not, it's, it comes from a lot of his life experience. And um, well, that's very fascinating. Well, thank you, Anne. Well, that's it for Chapter 1. We'll be back in a few moments with Chapter 2 with Anne Croker. Well, welcome back to this episode of The Omnibus Show. This is Chapter 2. We're with Anne Croker today. And Anne, um, you, were, you were telling me about the process and your experience of being a writer. Here in Chapter 2, I'd like to, to get some of your insight as a writing coach for people who are aspiring writers, and even people out there who may be writers who've already published. Um, everybody's welcome. And so um, what are some thoughts of um, someone who, let's start off with someone who wants to start to be a writer, and it doesn't matter what age they are, um, I hand it over to you because you, you have the experience on this. I think if you know the kind of writing you want to do, you want to write a novel, you want, want to write a prescriptive nonfiction book, you want to start publishing essays in literary magazines, figure out what you think your goal is, and maybe you don't know then start writing your way into that. Yeah. Start journaling. From there, there you're, you're, you're going to have insights. You're going to discover what matters and where you want to go. So I'd say regardless, start writing privately to figure out what you want to do publicly. Uh, because I assume that's what you mean by an aspiring writer, someone who wants to write publicly. Correct. Right? To be read. Correct. Okay. To be read. Yeah. And then kind of reverse engineer what it looks like. So if you're going to be writing a nonfiction book, what do you need? Well, you go find out what that is. And I'll tell you briefly, you're going to need a book proposal. And so find somebody who can guide you in how to put together a book proposal. If you want to start submitting essays or poetry to literary magazines, figure out what you need to do and back your way into that so that on this day, you're doing the very little tasks you need to do, which will include, we talked about this, reading, writing, getting input on your writing, but then moving toward these things. Any writer who wants to be read is going to need essentially what we call a platform. That's another thing. So figure out what it means to get in front of your readers, both now and the future readers, depending on the project you want to do. Mm -hmm. So those would be a few things that people could start doing now to become that writer later. That's fabulous because... Yeah, when I had written, although when I started out writing, it was in, in journalism, but some pieces and things that I've done, it's just like you, you kind of figure on your figure out on your own. And mm -hmm. To have a coach with your resource, your life resource and professional resources, just that's that's pretty incredible. What are some things? Um, things that's not always a good question, but what are some elements of, and you don't have to name names, but from um, clients of yours that have been sort of discovery for them? What was the like moments in their writing process? You know what I mean? It's like yeah. when they discovered, I'm going to get over the hill. I'm going to get up to the top of the mountain. 
Right, right. Because you, there's a lot of self-doubt, I think, for writers. Most creative people, they kind of suffer through that. There's writer's block, and it's coming from maybe perfectionism or self-doubt or mm -hmm. imposter syndrome. And the way through is to do the work. And so I think when they start writing, that's when this discovery happens. And you've probably heard people like, let's see, Flannery O'Connor said, I write because I don't know what I think until I read what I say. And I think there's that kind of discovery that happens, this personal discovery, like, ah, oh, it's coming yeah. together because I wrote. I wrote my way into it. Right. Then this can happen with novelists. This can happen with short stories. It can happen with nonfiction. Anything we're writing, we can write our way into it and discover what we think. And we can write more clearly because we understand better what we think and believe. And so that would be something that happens often. A, g a good example, I think, of someone who had, uh, she, she came to me to develop her craft. She wanted to become a better writer. She had already had some small pieces submitted and accepted at small publications. And she came to me and said, I want to I want to write better. So we worked on that. And at some point I asked her, do you have any idea of what ultimate goal, not ultimate, but you know, a future goal you have? And she said, I'll think about it. And then a few times later, she said, I know what I want to do. This is m several years ago. She sure. said, I want to start a blog, which it was still relatively new. I said, we can do that. I got her started on a platform. And I, for some reason, I'm, I have a memory of holding my laptop. I'm not sure why I was standing and holding it, but we had everything lined up. It was time to, to have her first piece go public. And I said, I think you should click the button. We had, she, I had helped her set it up and showed her how to get it loaded. Oh, nice. And she said, okay. That's so, big. So she clicks publish. And I said, okay, now it's available for anybody in the whole world to, if they have internet access to read. And I looked at her and there's tears in her eyes. I said, what's wrong? And she wasn't, she wasn't the type to get teary eyed. Yeah. And she said, Anne, this is the first time I've ever had a voice. Wow. And so that kind of moment for her and for me, mm -hmm. that's, that's why I love coaching. That's but great. then I have others, you know, who, who I had somebody come to me who wanted to write a book, had never written one and wanted to do it right. Mm -hmm. Met with a coach, which is a great way, again, to save time, just to speed up the whole process. So we talked about, you know, the path forward. He wanted to pursue traditional publishing versus um, self-publishing. So we, we did the steps that that takes to develop an idea, to develop the book proposal that you'll need to be able to land an agent. Yeah. And he went on to win the best Christian Book of the Year award, the best new writer of the year award in 2020. Everything was virtual. Um, but it was, it, right, it starts here with, I want to write a book. It's a spark mm -hmm. of an idea. But then what do you do with that spark? Well, sure. you just take these steps forward. And yeah. then, you know, he had, he had all, a lot of moments along the way. And I think when you're tackling something as big as a book, you need to have smaller milestones and discoveries and aha moments along yeah. the way. Or otherwise, it's a very long time before you see it come into the world. It's very long. It can be a very long process. And without somebody there, either a coach or an editor, that could take decades. It can take a long time. Yeah. And, and I love to see people take the risk to put something out there. Mm -hmm. You know, you risk a lot of things. You risk crickets. Nobody read it, reading it at all. True. You can risk criticism. You can risk um, somebody misunderstanding it. So it, there's a lot of risk involved or criticizing the writing itself. But until we start taking that step, you know, you're just, you might as well be writing in your journal. Sure. I mean, it's great to develop your craft and take your time and make sure you feel like you're ready for prime time, as it were. But I think you've got to start sending something out there, whether you start a sub stack and start writing that way, get a few people who are signed up with their email address. Now you have a way to email them and, you know, invite them into your world and they're inviting you into theirs. It's a big deal. Yeah. Well, platforms are, are, that's what you have to do now with the mm -hmm. uh, the internet is is like newspapers are now inter on the internet and TV has become the internet with YouTube etc and um, yeah the platform that that's a good insight um, say somebody wants to publish a book and you, you've you've just spoken about that um, it's really a publisher right I mean there's a few steps. If somebody wanted to uh, publish a book, mm -hmm. what are the, the milestones? And there's a lot to get there in between. It's, it's always work, mm -hmm. you know, but what are, what are just, for, you know, there's some candy from Anne. What, <laughs> what are some milestones that, that need to be met? 
Well, with a novel, you yeah. have to write the entire novel. It has to be complete before you start pitching. Okay. So the goal there is to write a really amazing novel that is irresistible, and you'll have a good chance then of landing an agent and then landing a publishing contract. So your path, if you're going to go the traditional route, would be to write the, write the entire novel, land an agent, land a, land a contract. If you want to self-publish, uh, this is a viable option. No longer is it considered just vanity press, as it mm -hmm. was in, in my childhood when my parents would scoff at anybody. I remember that term yeah. was used We don't even use that term anymore because no, it's not thought that way anymore. It's yes. a legitimate path forward. And I have a client who wanted to improve his craft, came to me. He already was making a, mo a modest income from writing uh, genre fiction. Mm -hmm. And I didn't read in that. I didn't read that particular genre. And so he said, I, that's, I said, I can't really help you with plotting or anything. I'll handle that. You help me with the writing. <laughs> All right. And so we did. And he's gone on to continue to write um, in that series. And so once people discovers it, they want all of them. Yeah. And so because he's very fast, he always has something new for people to buy. And they'll discover here and they'll buy all of them, you know. So that's a path forward, too, for people. Mm. And that's where you're going to now have to think as a self-published author, you're going to have to line up all the things that the traditional publisher would have done for you. You're going to have to find an, a developmental editor, a copy editor, a proofreader, a designer of your cover, a designer for the interior pages. You're going to have to figure out if you want to, to develop an imprint for yourself. All these things would be handled through traditional publishing, but there are gatekeepers mm -hmm. for traditional publishing. You have to jump through hoops and prove yourself and hear no maybe a hundred times. Uh, I hope not that many times, but you might. <laughs> it, it can happen. And, and, but I think both paths are, have promise and pros and cons, but you, know, you, you're, you make more money per book. As True. a self-published author, you're going to get, but more. you need to sell it yourself. Yeah, and do everything. And you the, have maybe some. You have to do the some, marketing, which mm -hmm. is the big thing. Which you have to do either way. True. They expect a lot. Yeah, of they, expect they expect you a lot of us to, to do yeah. that. But then, if you're writing a nonfiction book, you actually don't have to write the entire book in advance. Mm -hmm. You you actually develop this book proposal, which I mentioned, and that has a few sample chapters to show that you can write to sure. prove that you write well. But you develop the book and you develop the table of contents and these chapter summaries so that the decision maker sees where you're going with it. Yes. They read your sample chapters and they can make a, a an informed decision about the book and you based on that book proposal. So that you don't really write the whole book in advance. But you will, oh. of course, eventually have to write the book when you land the contract. So but those, well, this is just talking about books. Too. Sure, of course, sure. There, like, as I said, in my own history, there are many other ways to be a very successful and fulfilled writer without writing a book. Well, there are many blogs out there that have their own, they have their own life. And I mean, in a way that um, I'm just thinking many and various people out there. I mean, there are, oh gosh, there are like photography, like travel photography blogs that are just amazing. Yes. Um, I, I, I usually don't listen to a lot of, and it's not a kind of a put down thing. It's just a lot of musicians. They're good at music, but um, and it's been a while since I've seen it. But the um, the old um, twelve string guitarist Roger McGuinn from the, the the band The Birds, he and his wife have done a blog, which is very interesting because he's you know he's got a famous life and he still he still travels himself and still tours and. He's writing about his life mm -hmm. experiences along the way, which a lot of people don't do that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's um, with that much life experience, and and that's that's been one of the, the most fascinating blogs. And on writers, there are many people, as you've said, um, and that's critical, really. I mean, what a time to today. be alive! That, that with the click of a button, mm -hmm. you can be read by anybody in the world. Correct. You uh, upload this to a podcast or a YouTube channel. It can be found, watched, enjoyed by anybody in the world. I mean, like, what a time to be alive, right? It I mean, this is amazing. We have agency now with our creative work. Mm -hmm. We can make decisions, like the woman who pressed publish on her blog post. That's great. So mm -hmm. I think it's amazing, yeah. That is. Thank you so much for sharing that. And, um, yeah, on this point, what is coming up for Anne? Mm -hmm. What what do we have to look forward to? And um, please tell our audience about um, writing possibilities and, mm. and so forth. I do a lot more coaching than I do writing these days, other than the writing I do that is coaching related. So mm -hmm. I don't have any books 
yet um, coming up. But really what I'm doing is coaching and celebrating the successes of the writers that I work with. Okay. And so really for me, in the future, it's steady as she goes. I continue to build my coaching business. I work one-on-one -on -one with people a lot because then they get that one-on-one -on -one interaction. That's the best. And and they get input on their work. I Because of my editing background, I can offer specific notes on their writing, which not all coaches do. That makes you even better. <laughs> well, my goal is to not just make the piece better, but to use the piece to make the writer better. Sure. Um, are you Are you booked up? Or are, can people still, um, is there still I can, room? For... I can almost always do a one-off call to get to know each other yeah. and to give you some first steps that you can take. So I, I offer a book proposal program. It's one of my signature programs. I launched last year the Art and Craft of Writing, and it, you, that's where we really develop the craft of writing in an eight-week intensive in a very small uh, small group of people. It's virtual, so you don't have to be local to be able to participate. And so those are some of the things that I, I do on an ongoing basis. People can find out everything about what I do by going to ancroker.com slash everything. It's my everything page. And that's where they can see more about my one-on-one -on -one coaching and all those programs. And then smaller courses that I offer as well. And they can contact me there too. Sure. So, so they can, on your website, they can also um, contact you for coaching. Yes. And they can... See your books, yes, and your blog, yes, everything, and <laughs> your um, your podcast, mm -hmm. yes. Although that you know they can get that in any of their podcast players. It's Ann Croker, writing coach. Well, thank you, Ann. Well, that's it for today's episode of the Omnibus Show. We'd like to thank Ann Croker, and we'd like to thank our sponsor, Hotel Carmichael. Today we're here at Feinstein's. We look forward to being with you again in our next episode of The Omnibus Show. If you enjoyed this program, please like, share, and subscribe to continue the conversation. For The Omnibus Show newsletter, please sign up at theomnibusshow.com.